so let's um, let's uh, start um so paul um he says you know don't receive the grace of god in vain okay so the grace of god is uh, and, and we saw you know even in the previous episode he says you know i this is what i do like i i don't uh, uh, i uh, i don't want to uh, uh, just one second let i'm just getting sharing the tab okay okay just coming up so he says um, you know the, the lord's grace towards me was not in vain okay it was, was not futile uh was not wasted in other words so similarly he says um to the corinthian believers uh and uh, to all the all those who are reading you know which especially for us you know, don't um uh you know let the grace of god towards you not be in vain or uh, or uh, in here particularly he says don't receive the grace of god in vain i plead with you not to receive the grace of god in vain okay when you, when you look at verse 2 um, you know we we looked at you know how can it be in vain you know how can the grace of god be received in vain we look you know, we get excited we don't put in effort we don't work when it when we have to and therefore it in a way it's wasted in the sense you know the grace of god has actually drawn us we are saved by his grace but when you actually look at his uh, you know the the gifts that he's given the the power that he's clothed us with everything is not used right it's it's not put to good use or put to the use that we we could right really uh, because he considers us as ambassadors we, he considers us as his representative his, the representative of his kingdom so in that sense it is not really put to full use right we enjoy the grace uh, we are born again but it's not put to the full use for which it is meant we are new creations if you see you know uh, verse 17 anyone is in christ he's a new creation all things have passed away all things have become new and then he goes on to say in the very next verse itself he has given us the ministry of reconciliation you know you are a new creation you have a wonderful you know uh, uh, renewal and reviving that has happened but now you have a responsibility which is the ministry of reconciliation the very next verse right uh, verse 18 so so this is the thing so let it not be wasted and then verse 2 he says for he says in an acceptable time i have heard you and in the day of salvation i've helped you behold now is the accepted time now is the day of salvation so say you know do not waste any time do not delay do not put off um what you need to be doing because today is the day of salvation and today is the day of salvation now is accepted time acceptable time today is the day of um, salvation okay um then uh, verse 3 we give no offense in anything that our ministry sorry uh, let me just put that here yeah we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of god okay that, the section after that we look at it a little later so what is he saying you know we give no offense in anything you know that word offense used there in greek meaning um proskope it carries this uh meaning that we are not putting a stumbling block you know we are not creating an opportunity for someone to trip over or stumble because of our ministry you know we are not giving them an opportunity to fall so he's saying we no give no offense in anything so that our ministry may not be blamed so we don't want to do anything we don't want to behave in a way uh, so that people will fall or people will stumble and and then our ministry is blamed because of that so we give no offense in anything so it means that uh, in the words that we speak in how we live our life in the things that we do right are we causing others to stumble okay sometimes you know uh, we know okay 
you know hey if i do this maybe it will cause person to person to a person to stumble you know it, it could be that you have a right to do it in the sense um it's it's not that uh, it's it's not some anything sinful it's not something that is uh, you know uh, questionable but but maybe you know uh, it's like you know um, in in one corinthians we we said we looked at that no we said paul behaving in a certain way because of the weaker brother right? or the weaker sister because of their conscience because they are not because they are not strong in the faith uh, he's saying i will not do certain things to make them stumble right uh, in fact he says you know i will not eat meat again if that is what will cause them to stumble and i will not do that so um so we see that in our words in our actions in our the way we live our life you know is there anything that will cause the other person to stumble okay so now we don't have to always you know be oh am i saying the right thing am i doing the right thing it's not like that you know when god tells you when the word of god convinces you convicts you then we don't have to rebel against it or we should not rebel if god says okay don't do this uh, because our if someone you know uh, through someone god points out that okay maybe in this culture maybe you can you know you can be like this and uh, i know you know some people who in, because they were reaching out to a, a people of certain other faith they give up gave up a lot of things you know in the sense um, this person stopped you know he became a vegetarian right? because he was actually reaching out someone in up north in lucknow and uh, you know varanasi kind of area and he was actually reaching out to um um you know a, a community which was not which was vegetarian in nature uh which so he he said you know i'll give up okay. and uh, in fact he went on to the extent of even changing the way he you know he used the clothes that he used to wear you know it was typically like a very 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 indian kind of a thing you know wearing dhotis and and tying it in a certain way uh because he he didn't want to make put a stumbling block you know maybe there the mindset was okay you know this guy is speaking uh he's not speaking in hindi uh you know he's so western you know he's not singing these he's you know he's singing these kind of songs or this kind of music he's western you know and though this is religion is a western religion a white man's religion you know all that he did not want to give a cause for offense so he was very careful and also he made certain sacrifices so paul is saying you know we don't give any offense in anything we don't give an opportunity for people to stumble and fall because of the way we live okay the way we live um and uh, uh by which the ministry itself is blamed we don't want to do that okay see the thing is the message itself is offensive right in the sense uh, why is it offensive it it causes you know uh, people to um it causes uh, you know like uh, the message the truth itself you know the truth itself of the gospel that he is the only way that is offensive for people okay the, when we declare the truth that is offensive for people now that is fine okay in the sense uh, people will be get offended they might bring false accusations they might make fun of the ministry make fun of the work that is being done you know which is okay right that is because of the truth because of the message itself right but we need to be careful not to add to that or not to bring dishonor to god by you know by the words we speak by our irresponsible behavior and action okay so we need to live above reproach lives lives that are you know that cannot be blamed ministry that cannot be blamed uh and that uh we need to be careful we need to be culturally sensitive uh we need to be sensitive to the leading of the spirit of god and and in all that right so so that's the thing so then he says in um okay in uh, in verse 4 now in all things we commend ourselves okay now in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of god so we are in chapter 6 and verse 4 okay we commend ourselves or we we approve you know uh, uh it's if you want to say you know it's it's like um, 
uh, an approval that we bring uh, we can say this is why we are approved we commend ourselves as uh, ministers of god okay so in what way like he lists down a lot of things right we we commend we approve ourselves or we introduce ourselves as ministers of god in all these ways he goes on to say what those are you know he says in much patience in tribulations in needs in distresses you know so you see the kind of things that he lists are not hey we saved so many lives you know we did so many things we did some wonderful things well which is all that they did hey, but he's talking about the life and character he's talking about the hardships he's talking about the reality of ministry work and he's saying you know this is what actually recommends us or we commend ourselves with this you know we all we went through this and and then he gives that list okay in much patience so we were patient in tribulations you know in a lot of difficulties in needs like there were needs shortcomings limitations in in distresses in stripes meaning physical punishment right in philippi they they you know uh, they actually whipped them on the back it says they laid many stripes on their back so uh, which means that they they hit them or whipped them or came them that that actually put a stripe you know the which the blood came out right so it says through stripe in stripes in imprisonments in tumults right in in a, in a lot of there was a lot of churning emotionally you know uh, there's upheaval so uh, in in tumults and um, and it says you know there was a lot of confusion tumults meaning there's a lot of confusion a lot of disorder a lot of this uh, you know instability disturbance we didn't know what to do you know those that kind of an uh, that kind of a scenario right so it says in uh, in tumults and then in labors uh, so because he worked hard right you you know that uh, he he worked with his hands Paul says he worked with his hands. He labored with his hands in order to provide for himself and for his team. Yes. There were others who were supporting the ministry. Yes, there were there were many who were not, and uh, he would provide for those needs, uh, especially with his hands, like the work he did. Uh, especially the Corinth, church, Corinth, uh, this particular church, he didn't take any money. He didn't receive any support from them. Um, he writes about that a little later right he in fact he said uh, i robbed other churches in order to serve you you know in the sense that other churches gave in order to for me to minister and serve you right i took care of my own needs um, like because he knew that there were these kind of um, you know dissensions and strife and so on so um, he took care of his own needs right so says uh, in in labors in sleeplessness in fastings by purity by knowledge by long suffering by kindness by the holy spirit by sincere love okay so he's, he's talking about the fruit of the spirit the character and nature of god you know purity um long suffering kindness uh, sincere love um goes on to say word of truth by the power of god by armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left by honor and dishonor meaning well there are certain places where they honored us there are certain places where they dishonored us uh, by evil report they said good things about us they said bad things about the evil report and good report as deceivers you know they said we were deceivers and and yet true you know they called us deceivers but then we were actually speaking the truth and yet true as unknown uh, many places we were not known to the people and yet well known well known to god right uh, i'm just assuming that right that it could mean that and yet well known as dying and behold we live and we carried he says we carried about us in our in our bodies a a death sentence right a sentence of death so as dying and uh, behold we live as people who were chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things so in all these ways Paul says we commend ourselves as ministers of god we commend ourselves as ministers of christ right 
So um, he gives this entire list there saying, you know, we, yes, as new creations, we are ambassadors. As ambassadors, we, we try and not give any offense to anyone so that the ministry is not uh, blamed. But this is how we live. This is how we minister. Okay. It's not the outward things. It not, it's not like, you know, uh, outward appearance or speech or, you know, excellent speech or eloquence and, you know, all those other talents and abilities. But in these ways, he says, you know, this would commend us. This would approve us as ministers of God to you, come to serve you. Okay. Um, okay. So let's look at verse 11. Verse 11, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. So he's saying, you know, we have spoken openly to you. We have not held back anything from you. Uh, we have not hidden anything from you. Uh, we, have, we have spoken the truth. Right? We have spoken openly. Our heart is wide open. There's nothing uh, hidden in our hearts. And we have also received you openly. So probably Paul sensed that they were distancing themselves from him, right? They were, while well, all the time they were inviting the others, but they were, for some reason, you know, maybe he sensed that they were distancing, saying, you know, our heart is wide open. You are restricted by your own affections, your own emotions and your own likes and dislikes because of which you are restricted, you are held back. It's not because of us, right? We have spoken openly, our heart is wide open. And the restriction that you feel, you feel that you are, you know, you cannot approach us or you are distancing yourself from us. It's because of your own thoughts, emotions, your own likes, your own dislikes. It's because of you, right? Now he's saying, uh, we have been wide open. I'm saying, you know, as to children, you also be open. You also be open, um, because as of you know, he goes on to say, as a father, uh, you know, in the gospel, I have begotten you as dear children, and so on. Right, saying you know, as as I speak as to children, I'm speaking as a father to the child. Uh, you also be open. There's no need for you to be closed to what I'm saying, to what I'm you know ministering. You you also be open. Okay? And then verse fourteen: Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Okay, so he's addressing, here he is addressing um, a, a, a thing that he has noticed or something that he has seen. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God also has said, and so on. Okay, let's look at those. So he asks several questions for which um, the answer is obviously no, there is no connection. Now that that is the response. You know, just like how um, in in one Corinthians twelve, towards the end, he asks, right? Do all speak with tongues? Are all apostles? Are all workers of miracles? Right. So the answer is no. The same way here, he's asking those questions, and he he makes that statement: Do not be unequally yoked with uh, unbelievers. So. So the picture there is uh, yoke. The, what he uses, the word used there, you know, don't be unequally yoked, is that uh, when there are farm animals, animals working on a farm in agriculture or a field, uh, they cannot be an unequal yoke. You know, two different animals, one, you know, let's say like a, one is, let's say like a horse, which is fast, and you can't put a donkey, which is very rebellious and slow. You can't put both together, right? And... Um, I think it's Deuteronomy 10, which talks about that. Let's let's read that verse. Um, um, okay, Deuteronomy. Okay, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 10. A very practical 
you know, verse, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Okay, so the donkey might, might be rebellious, might be, you know, might not really plow, but where an ox is strong and it's plowing and it will, in fact, pull the donkey uh, and it, it will not be effective. Okay, so the, the work done will not be effective. The life lived will not be effective. Um, it will be it'll be full of struggle. You know, it will be pulling in different directions. Uh, there will not be oneness. Right? There will not be agreement. Right. So, so he's, he goes on to say, don't be unequally yoked. Okay, so that, um, so, and well, what is an unequal yoke? It, it's an unequal yoke similar to this but when, when when you say in human terms it means that you cannot have a deep fellowship uh with an unbeliever you know well we we always we need to have love we need to have friendships but an unequal yoke goes beyond that okay it's 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 not about not having friendships it's not have a not a not you know, not associating with people. Uh, it's not that, you know, because we know that the Lord Jesus did that. Lord Jesus came and he, he you know, like he mingled with people, uh, with the Bible says that he he, uh, he was with sinners, so much so the Pharisees actually saw, you know, why, why is he always spending this time, right? So the thing is, it goes beyond that. It's not uh, with the intent of influencing or changing. But, so it's talking about something else. It's goes, it talks about a yoke. Okay, it talks about uh, maybe something like a covenant or an agreement. He's saying they cannot be, okay. For example, uh, a marriage relationship, a marriage covenant. Now that's, if there is a believer and an unbeliever, then it'll be a unequal yoke. Unequal yoke. Just like how you're putting an ox and a you know, donkey together. It's an unequal yoke. They cannot accomplish what... Uh, purposes God has for them, they cannot accomplish in their lives. It's going to be, it's going to be a struggle. They are not going to, you know, agree to do the same thing. It's going to be a lot of difficulties. Maybe in a typical marriage, you know, there'll be arguments and there'll be difficulties because of the faith. Right? One person is born again. Is uh, there's something very different, very, very uh, deep that has happened in the spirit. He's a born again person, right? The spirit is born again. Now for the other person, the spirit is not born again. So cannot relate to God, cannot connect to God, cannot hear from God. So all these things are there. Uh, does not have a love for the word, does not have a love. You know? So um, whatever that person does is something exterior and external. You know, saying, okay, I'll, you know, the person is pulling in the other, other direction, right? So Paul warns and says, do not be unequally yoked. So it could be a marriage covenant and, or it could be an influence environment, you know, an unequal yoke could be an environment. It could be a, you know, place or something where, see now we, we are in the world, right? So we are in such worldly environments, especially if you're working somewhere, if you're working for a company. So the environment is different. It's not, it's not, quote unquote Christian in that sense, right? Um, so the environment is different. So but when we let that environment influence our thinking, okay, influence our thinking, influence our action because of that environment, and we become conformed to the values, uh, worldly values, our worldly uh, standards, then we are getting unequally yoked, right? Because you know that you're a believer, you know that you have a different set of values and standards, but now because of the environment, you are changing that stand, right? You are getting yoked unequally. You're, you're becoming conformed to the world. Uh, it could even be a, you know, a business partnership or relationship, you know, where uh, worldly values, ideals influence the decision which are directly opposite of the principles which are there, the truth which is there in God's word. Now, um, well, when, when we talk about environments and business partnerships and all that, no, that's, that's a slightly di more difficult thing to control, right? Um, but scripture is very clear. Don't be unequally yoked because 
if there's an unequal yoke, there's going to be problems. You know, there will be struggle, there will be problems. You as a believer might get pulled in, sucked in, and, uh, you know, and things would change. That's the reality. Um, so Paul is saying, you know, don't be unequally yoked. Um, and then he goes on to ask those questions, right? Uh, and in each of those questions, he uses uh, different words to describe the the kind of uh, the kind of yoke that is, right? So he's saying, you know, what fellowship does uh, righteousness has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship? Okay. The, you know, the, you know, the, the Greek word used there has this idea of, of again, sh sharing or participation. It's not koinonia, but it's metoke. Okay. Um, so you're saying what fellowship, what kind of sharing or participation does righteousness have with lawlessness? Right? Righteousness, there's nothing common, exactly opposite. Okay. And lawlessness is about having no laws doing the wrong thing to uh, to not you know to making fun of the right things right totally violating it so that's lawlessness so what connection does you know these two things have it's totally opposite righteousness lawlessness then secondly use the word koinonia what communion has light with darkness okay so first word is used as a fellowship and that's another Greek word called metoke, then he uses the word called koinonia. And uh, yeah, here he uses the word uh, koinonia to mean, you know, there is again, uh, it's much much stronger word, like right? participation, sharing, closeness, intimacy. And uh, it says, okay, what koinonia does light have with darkness? Okay, when you look at light in the natural, it's... Uh, it's totally different. But figuratively, when you see it, light refers to illumination. It refers to purity. It refers to truth. So what does what connection does that have with ignorance or immorality or lies okay, or uh, inability to understand or perceive? Right? What ability or what connection is there? Answer, no connection. Right? The other question is, what accord or what agreement does Christ have with Belial? Okay. So another stronger thing is saying, you know, comparing Christ and Belial. Excuse me. Let's see. So he's saying, you know, what connection is there between Christ and Belial? You know, what connection is there between the Messiah, the Anointed One, and Satan. Okay, so that that Hebrew word literally means worthless, worthlessness. So, the Anointed One, Messiah, what connection is there, or what fellowship is there, what agreement is there? Is there an agreement between Christ and Satan? No. He's using strong words, right? So he's saying, you know, in, in other words, to say that it is like that. If you're unequally yoked, well, that is what it it, it is as similar as that. It's, it's like saying that there is a connection. You know, it's a strong uh, statement. Right? When it comes to, you know, it's it's not about hating the person. It's not about, uh, you know, being associated with that person. It's not about even you know giving your life for the person. No, but he's talking about a deep commitment, like marriage, or maybe it's a uh, as a business partnership or any other kind of a link, right? He's saying it will not work. It will not work. Okay. Because many, you know, many kind of enter into, a, especially marriage covenant, no, like marriage covenant, saying, okay, I'll do it one day, that person will come to the Lord. Or because of my life, because of my testimony, that person will come to the Lord. Uh, or I will share Jesus, you know, and that person. The thing is, before marriage, that person will say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I also believe in Jesus. Okay. Now, why 
just because you you know it's before the wedding no before the marriage so the person will say yeah yeah i also believe i also know jesus even though you know um but i have not uh, not yet accepted i i've not yet you know received him but uh, i believe i'm i'm coming close to him i'm getting to know him and etc and then you know they have their wedding vows and get married and then the whole thing continues the same way you have no assurance that the person will actually accept the lord right the person would have just said those things um uh, in order to get married in order to not to lose you know the other person's relationship right the person might be good the person might be noble the person might be a good person you know we're not saying anything about the character we're not saying that you know, because some people say you know he's better than all the other christians true we're not saying anything about the character but the fact is the person is not born again and right? so the values will be different um so they will not be drawn to the cross they will not be drawn to the lord so that basic foundation itself is not there it's broken right so there's no that basic agreement is not there at least if that basic agreement is there all other things you know if even if there are differences they can fall in place where you can sit together and pray and say okay god you know we come before you we submit ourselves to you but that is not possible yeah right so um, the other other thing is what part does the unbeliever have with the believer what part has the believer have with an unbeliever and the word used there um uh, sunka uh, sunkates is means approval or assent uh, or in company with so what approval or what um, assent or what uh, you know what do they have Oh, sorry sorry uh, that is uh, uh, that is the next word so part means meres which means uh, merese um, that word means uh, a share or portion i'm sorry uh, i i actually was explaining the other word so what part has believer with the unbeliever so what portion or share does the believer have with the unbeliever okay then uh, uses another another question he asks is you know what agreement so he uses that word sunkate says what agreement or approval or assent does the temple of god have with idols okay so again the spiritual body of christ the temple of god we are the people of god we are the temple of god you know and we we read that in first corinthians 3 first corinthians 6 he talks about first corinthians 3 he talks about you know you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwells in you you are the temple so he's saying what what agreement what approval what agreement does these two things do these two things have the thing is that you know there is no fellowship there is no communion there is no part no accord no agreement so um so he's using you know it's a strong statement these are strong questions and strong comparisons you know very very strong comparisons and he's using that to say you know it's going to be a futile exercise if you are unequally yoked he's warning the believer uh, not to be yoked unequally okay um okay and he also uh, uh, yeah so from verse uh, as part of the second part of verse 16 he says for you are the temple of the living god as god has said i will dwell in them and walk among them i will be their god and they shall be my people therefore come out from among them and be separate says the lord do not touch what is unclean and i will receive you i will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters says the lord almighty now this is from jeremiah chapter 31 right so uh but we need to understand it in the context okay god's promise is that he will dwell with us he will walk among us he will be our god and he's called us his people right and so because he's he's among us he's with us he's called us his people he says you know do not come out from among them be separate from them do not touch what is unclean uh and i will receive you i'll be a father to you you will be my sons and daughters so he's talking he's inviting us to the communion you know which is above all communions is inviting us to that fellowship and agreement which is you know which is above all the other things 
uh, which we which we see listed there. So he's inviting us to that. We have the promise of God, but we need to see it in the right context. It, it doesn't mean that I alienate myself from the world. Okay, I just get away from it all. You know, some people do that, right? I don't want anything to do with unbelievers. You know, if there are believers, then that you know, if I am looking for a house, I want to look for a house where there are only believers <laughs> in the apartment. You know, only believers are there, and then I will. You know, all Christians are there. They say very proudly, you know, only Christians are living here, and uh, you know, things like that. So, so. So the thing is, you know, the con- context is not that. He's, he's, he, the context is that you keep yourself from the ways of the world. You keep yourself from being contaminated by the world, right? Uh, by, from being polluted by the world. Don't be, he said, come out, don't touch what is unclean. Meaning, um, where, yes, in those days, what is ritually impure, you know, you do not touch it, of course, but here, as uh, New Testament believers, it refers to us not being polluted by the ways of the world, by the way the world thinks, by the, some of the things that people indulge in. Don't don't get polluted. Let your life not be polluted by that. So you stay clean. And he's he's saying, you know, he's inviting us to that intimate relationship as as a family. Saying, you know, I will be their father, and they will be my sons and daughters. Right? So it's something beautiful, right? So God is saying, you know, you. This is the reason I, I want you to. I want to have this relationship, and this is the promise that He's giving. He said, um, "I will be their God, and they will be my people, and and not just that, but I will be a father to them, and they will be my sons and daughters. You know, like um, a father will, like a family, and uh, and the Lord is saying, you know." So it's a family, it's a relationship of love, it's a relationship of um, where there's protection, the father protects, the father provides, um, the father is there in times of need, the father is there to to help, the father is there to encourage, you know, even if an earthly father doesn't do all that, right, or has not done all that, and we may not have perfect earthly fathers, but our heavenly father does that. So he says, I will be the father to them and they will be my sons and daughters. And so this wonderful promise we have from God. Okay. Um, okay. So any thoughts here? Uh, we, I think we have 10 more minutes. We can go on to the next chapter. You know, anything that you, um, that you want to add to anything that maybe you have some questions about being unequally yoked um, or anything at all. You know, you can right, you can put it in the chat or you can ask. Right. Okay. If there's nothing, we'll we'll move on. And we see that in chapter seven, the same thought flows, right? So he's talking about not being unequally yoked. And he's talking, um, uh, and he's giving the reasons for that. Okay, and also he has Paul has also shared about uh, um, the fact that this is what referring to, um, you know, Jeremiah thirty-one is is referring to, um, you know, the kind of uh, uh, what is that verse again? Um, sorry, uh, let me just, yeah. Um, so he's referring to that. Uh, Verse, yeah, here it is. Come out, um, be separate, etc. And and he says it it is actually a well. It, there is a command in verse seventeen. There is a command, you know, do not touch, uh, etc. But it is a promise. If you say, if you see, it is a command because of the promise, right? And so he's. Referring to that promise, God has actually promised. God has actually made Himself available, and He's given Himself for this particular relationship. Um, he, living among us, living with us, uh, living in us, and uh, this relationship of God uh, and His people, this relationship of father and son and daughter. So, 
he's god is making himself available inviting us he's saying this is this can be a real reality you know you come out be separate etc now paul is referring to that promise again and he's saying verse 1 uh, let's read uh, chapter 7 verse 1 he's saying therefore having these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god okay perfecting holiness in the fear of god so he's saying you know you take up it's your responsibility what is my responsibility now we have this promise we have this invitation we have this promise we have this reality that god is uh, god is you know our father and we are his sons and daughters and we we can have this wonderful relationship we can have walk in this closeness but we have a responsibility what is that responsibility let us cleanse ourselves okay so i take responsibility for my life to cleanse my life from all filthiness of the flesh right? from all works of the flesh from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the uh, fear of god so the way i conduct my life the way i live my life is to um, to look and see you know is there anything that i'm indulging in which is not a work of the spirit but as a work of the flesh you know which is which can come under this whole category of works of the flesh you know like we see in galatians um in galatians 5 we see you know the works of the flesh are this and then goes on to list down so um have nothing to do you know cleanse ourselves now that responsibility is ours as believers that responsibility is us we can't blame it on god we can't put it on god and say okay god you do it no now i have all this i have this promise i have this invitation so i need to take responsibility for my actions right and say okay i and make some changes right empowered by god empowered by the spirit led by the spirit so that's that's the thing you know perfecting holiness in the fear of god so i need to take action when i know something that hey this is a work of the flesh i have nothing to do with it okay romans 8 and verse 13 the warning is this that if we live according to the flesh um we will sorry if you live according to the flesh you die. but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live okay so that's the that's again the warning if you live according to the flesh you will die you know the living according to the flesh brings about death uh, uh you know brings about uh, uh, a separation from god brings about a separation from the works of god right? and it will result in you know physically also it will affect you it will bring about death because uh, that is what the works of the flesh does so if you live according to the flesh according to the pull of the flesh according to the desire of the flesh according to the you know the temptations of the flesh if you live if your lifestyle is going to be like that you will die there will be a separation from the righteousness of god there will be a separation from the uh, from god himself that law, that, because that is the root right that is where it is leading but if by the spirit if by the holy spirit you put to death right you bring an end you bring a separation death is separation right death is an end death is a separation if you put to death if you bring to an end if you bring a separation to the deeds of the body it says you will live you will live you will not die you will live okay now the thing is first of all how do we do that we 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 need to be aware okay what is the thing of the flesh what are the things that defile us in the flesh and spirit right uh, so when it comes to things of the flesh you know he uses two things right he says um from all filthiness of the flesh right cleanse yourself all filthiness of the flesh and spirit okay so that's uh, that's interesting because uh, filthiness of the flesh we understand but what is it of the spirit okay what can contaminate the spirit right uh because the spirit is anyway born again right it's new it's it's kainos unused fresh the thing is when i move away from the truth of god and i when i receive into my spirit 
deception and lies and uh, sometimes it's deceiving teaching you know deceptive teaching um, then that pollutes the spirit as well no that's the only that's uh, i mean that's the only inference right that's the conclusion that what what actually goes into the spirit man is what you receive as you know as truth and uh, so what can contaminate is maybe there is false teaching or maybe you know sometimes even our motives and attitudes you know that can contaminate the spirit so uh, but primarily you know wrong teaching or wrong beliefs uh, contaminating the spirit so saying you cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit uh, okay uh, again a warning here in ephesians 5 fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness uh, let it not even be named among you as is fitting as is fitting for the saints neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks okay so he's saying you know you live a life of consecration you don't indulge in the uh, things of the flesh okay okay then again he repeats this uh, interesting right he says open your hearts to us Uh, verse 2 no chapter 7 verse 2 open your hearts to us we have wronged no one we have corrupted no one we have cheated no one okay again it's uh, it's good to look at those uh, three words that he's saying he says um, which means that these are not to be part of the life of a minister of god right uh, he and his ministry team they have not wronged anyone they have not corrupted anyone they have not cheated anyone so wrong to work rules there um, the greek word used there means to be unjust to do something wrong morally socially physically and we have not wronged anything we have wronged anyone right second thing he says we have not corrupted we have corrupted no one okay? to corrupt means to destroy to lead away from the uh, from the way of holiness like to lead away from holiness to be um, to to destroy to corrupt something to bring in some kind of decay right so saying we've corrupted no one no one's lives have we corrupted and third thing is he says we have cheated no one which means to defraud someone to take advantage of someone maybe someone's money maybe someone's possessions you know you say something and you say okay uh, i need this and you you know whatever through the words or whatever so he's saying we have cheated no one um we have not taken advantage for our selfish gain okay so so a true minister of god a true believer a true minister will never do these things we should not do these things okay okay so we'll stop here so we have stopped here at um verse 2 right chapter 7 verse 2 we started with chapter 5 verse 12 and we've gone all the way to chapter 7 and verse 2 uh, so next class we'll continue with the rest okay fine okay we'll stop here um god bless you guys have a great weekend we'll catch up again next week bye bye